Good evening. Is this working? Yes, it is. Um, yeah, good evening and uh, a very warm welcome to the Hattie School. I'm absolutely delighted to see such a wonderfully large audience uh, to welcome European Commissioner for Economy, Paolo Gentiloni. You do not... <laughs> Paolo Gentiloni, you do not really need an introduction, but allow me to summarize your um, high-level political career, first in Italy and then in the EU, in a few words. So, born in Rome, uh, Paolo Gentiloni graduated in political science, excellent choice, from the Sapienza University. He has been active in left-wing politics from his school days. You held many illustrious roles in Italian politics, Minister of Communication, Minister of Foreign Affairs, 2014 to 2016, Prime Minister 2016 to 2018, which means you really saw also the first years of Brexit uh, firsthand. And you were president of the Democratic Party from 2019 to 2020. In 2019, uh, Paolo Gentiloni then moved north to join Ursula von der Leyen's European Commission in Brussels as Commissioner for Economy, which is, of course, a key portfolio. Since Paolo Gentiloni joined the Commission, the European Union and Europe more widely has seen uh, a number of strong challenges. The pandemic, we all remember this room, of course, entirely empty. The war in Ukraine, which has by now lasted for almost one year, the question of short-term and long-term energy supplies, and related to all the above, the challenges to the green transition, which I understand you called the uh, industrial revolution of our century. Challenges for Europe are always challenges for Germany as well, from energy supplies over leadership to the Zeitenwende in foreign and military policy. So you, Paolo Gentiloni, you know German politicians very well from your time in Italy, but also from your time uh, in the European Commission. And uh, you commented uh, quite uh, a bit on uh, Germany. And you said, for instance, uh, the war in Ukraine has shown the limitations of the decade-long German approach of seeking to change Russia through trade and spells the end of globalization as we know it. We can read more of your take um, on the EU's current approach in uh, tomorrow's Frankfurter Allgemeine newspaper, I understand, and look forward uh, to. And the challenges for um, the EU, for Germany, and for European uh, politics, economics, globalization, foreign affairs is, of course, also something that we discuss a lot at the Hattie School, that we teach on, that we run research projects on, and it's, of course, at the heart of the work also of the Jacques Delors Center, which hosts us uh, tonight. I'm supposed to send very best wishes from Cornelia Woll, our, our president, who cannot be here tonight. But I would like to welcome you all. I'm delighted we have such a large audience on site, but also online. The event is uh, being live streamed and questions later on can also be asked in the chat. My particular welcome tonight uh, goes to the Ambassador of Italy, Armando Varicchio, members of the worlds of public policy, the public and students from Berlin and from further afield, my colleagues of the Hattie School faculty who are here with us, and of course, first and foremost, the Hattie School students from across our graduate programs. Paolo Gentiloni, we are absolutely delighted to welcome you uh, tonight, and your talk brings together all uh, the questions we mentioned above. A union of security and solidarity, building a fair, green, and competitive European economy. Welcome. Uh, well, thank you very much, Professor, dear students, Ambasciatore, uh, Libe Geste. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, let me thank the Hertie School and the Jacques Delors Center for this invitation. The Hertie School indeed has established itself as one of the best schools of public policy 
in Europe and the world in two decades. So it's great achievement. We are meeting here uh, in a uh, day that marks uh, the 90th anniversary of the uh, January the 30th, 1933, when the Nazis seized power and Hitler became chancellor. It was the beginning of the most bleak chapter of the European history. Let us never forget the horrors that ensued and the millions who suffered and were lost in the wake of that fateful day. And th this uh, adversary should remind us uh, that we must keep cherishing and nurturing what emerged in the decades that followed the darkness. So a strong and stable democracy in Germany, a united, peaceful, and prosperous Europe, and incredible achievements we should never take for granted. Why am I am remembering this? Because, of course, we also uh, so in, in the last year uh, how fragile these achievements are with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. When the invasion was launched almost one year ago, uh, the Russian troops didn't just trample over Ukraine's border. They trampled over the very notion of the rules-based international order and the values of Europe. And Russia didn't stop here. It then began to weaponize energy and food supplies, closing the taps on its pipelines to Europe and blocking shipments of grain from leaving Ukrainian ports. The effects of these actions have rippled across the world, but we have felt them most uh, acutely here in Europe. This was not a symmetric crisis, as it was the one of the pandemic. This was a crisis affecting in a different way, different part of the world, and especially affecting Europe and the emerging economies. Higher energy and food prices pushed inflation levels to 40-year highs, and our economies to the brink of a recession. But if the Kremlin believed it could fracture the EU, and sap our support for Ukraine, it achieved just the opposite. The war has marked a historic turning point for Europe's security policy and for the transatlantic relationship, what uh, the German chancellor called a Zeitenwend, and rightly so. Positions that were held for decades shifted in a matter of days. Three days after the invasion, Germany announced the radical increase of its defense budget, and it continues to provide essential military support to Ukraine. Sweden and Finland, as you know, decided to join NATO, and I trust, I trust, I hope, that the remaining NATO members will complete the ratification of their application without further delay. Denmark also put aside its 30 years long opt-out in the EU defense cooperation. And at EU level, for the first time in our history, we have mobilized funds for military equipment to assist a partner country under attack. Just last week, the Council agreed on another package of 500 million euros in military support, bringing this support to 3.6 billion. And while the war has strengthened the transatlantic alliance, it's also leading to a more integrated European defense system. Or at least it should. It's a matter to be discussed, I think. This is crucial. We need to take more responsibility on our own, not only to strengthen our security, but also as a way of shouldering our share of the burden in the framework of NATO. In the last 22 years, 99 to 21, combined EU defense spending grew by just 20%. Meanwhile, in the US, it increased by 66. Russia almost tripled its defense spending, and China's went up by almost 600%. So we need to spend more, but 
overall, but more than this, we need to spend better. This means investing in common defense together to building future common capabilities and not to pro proliferate national defense spending. This push towards a greater European security and autonomy is not limited to our common defense. Its implications extend to the kind of economy we want to build, the competitiveness of our industries, and next steps in European integration. So right up to the start of the war, Russia's was the EU's number one supplier of oil and gas, as you know very well. And this was the result of a relationship cultivated over decades, the, nation, the notion of Wandel durch Handel, of change through trade, which, by the way, was not just a German policy. It was a European and, in a certain sense, a also US-supported policy for several years. And while in insight it may look naive, one could be forgiven for having pursued it. In a way, European economic integration is a testament to bringing about change through trade. But it is now crystal clear that Wandel durch Handel can only work if there is a common set of values. And Putin destroyed this possibility. Despite its dependence on Russian fossil fuels, the EU did not hesitate to put an end to, its, to this relationship after the Kremlin began to weaponize energy. And I remember very well the comment uh, at the time, it is impossible, it will bring us to blackouts, to uh, closing of industries, bankruptcies, uh, mass unemployment. This was what uh, was where our concern last summer, not five years ago. And yet, here we are. EU gas storage levels are more than 70% full, even as imports of Russian gas fell by 80%. We diversified gas supplies. Germany, for example, has made incredible progress in building new LNG terminals in a matter of months thanks to our common response, and to be fair also to uh, mild weather conditions in the first part of this winter, we are in a good position for the rest of this winter and will be better placed to refill gas storage for the next winter. But it will not be an easy game. And we all know that the only lasting solution to this crisis is to massively accelerate the rollout of renewables and to phase out fossil fuels. By exposing the danger of our reliance on its fossil fuels, Russia has de facto, unintentionally, provided a major boost for the green transition in Europe. This reminds me of a poem by Friedrich Hölderlin Wo aber Gefahr ist, wächst das rettende auch. So energy prices have fallen significantly compared to the peak of last summer. And energy savings have increased. Still, the prices remain well above the average of recent years with serious implications for the competitiveness of Europe's industry. European companies now face structurally higher energy prices than their American or Asian competitors. Back to this asymmetry of this crisis, which is the basis of our competitiveness challenge. In a recent survey by the BDE, almost one in four companies said they were considering transferring shares, productions, or jobs abroad. The risk of relocation is compounded by the efforts of other countries to attract our companies, not just with lower energy prices, but with a host of other incentives. And we are seeing this now, particularly in the area of clean tech with the US Inflation Reduction Act. The green and digital transitions are also exposing 
how reliant we are on imported raw materials and key technologies, where the supply chains are overwhelmingly dominated by China. So the challenge to our competitiveness is threefold. High energy prices, industrial policies of other countries, and access to critical raw materials and technologies. And these three challenges are coming on top of um, our, our pre-existing difficulties and problems connected to, of course, what we call in our Brussels language, the capital market union. So the fact that we have several different uh, jurisdictions in Europe, and this is for sure not uh, encouraging uh, investors and uh, private uh, capital. So Europe must respond to these challenges with a new industrial policy. Of course, on the basis uh, of our uh, strength, we are the larger rich market in the world. We have incredible high skills, research, universities, labor force. So we are not starting from scratch. We are competitive, but we have some historic weakness, the capital market union, and we have new challenges, those that I mentioned before. We showed, for example, with offshore wind, that we can be a global leader in clean technologies also. And we must do the same in other strategic sectors like solar, hydrogen, batteries, and semiconductors. The EU must remain at the cutting edge of these innovations if it is to remain a global industrial power. On Wednesday, the day after tomorrow, we will put forward more details on our Green Deal industrial plan, as we call it now in the EU. What I can say today is that we are looking at how we can adjust in a targeted manner our state aid rules to support investments in clean tech. At the same time, we know that by doing so, we also run a risk of increasing fragmentation within the single market and the risk of growing divergence between member states with deeper pockets and those with less fiscal space. And we can't have the idea of a green transition only for countries with the high and large fiscal space, because of course Europe should go towards the green transition together. And this would also be the purpose of the new European Sovereignty Fund that President von der Leyen has called for. So, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, we have many challenges ahead of us, but we can also look back to some extraordinary achievements over the last few years. Many things that seemed impossible were made possible. Recovering from the pandemic, binding climate targets, decoupling from Russia. These results were achieved because we acted with unity, ambition, and solidarity. It is in this same spirit that we must now tackle another area where changes have long been considered a taboo, and that is the reform of our economic governance and fiscal rules. Those rules were designed in a very different economic and geopolitical environment. It is only natural that they should adapt as the world around us changes and new challenges emerge. And as times goes by, it is only fair to look at how our framework has performed to keep what has worked well and try to fix what has not. Namely, the fact that fiscal adjustment in the past was largely achieved by reducing investments with the consequence that the composition of public finances was not growth friendly. This is part of the reason for the EU's disappointing economic performance over the last decade. When I entered in office, now we are in a completely different world, but the problem of the European economy was 
what we labeled as the risk of a Japanization of the European economy, the low for long, low growth, low interest rates, low inflation. We are in a different world, but this low, low, low was part the result of the uh, decrease of public investment that came after the financial crisis. Low growth kept the level of debt high, also when primary surpluses were maintained over several years in several countries. The proposals we put forward in November seek to reconcile the objectives of safeguarding debt sustainability and supporting growth and investments. Under our, our reform framework, member states would have a greater ownership over the design of their fiscal trajectories, the rules would be simpler, and enforcement would be strengthened. I believe we have put forward cred well, of course, credible and balanced proposals, and reaching a swift agreement on a reform of our go economic governance would be an important part of our broader efforts to strengthen the economic and monetary union. Let me recall that this year marks the 30th anniversary of the single market, uh, the of the entry into force of the Maastricht Treaty, and 25 years since the establishment of the European Central Bank. So it's time to act and make progress also on our fiscal coordination. The euro was a profoundly geopolitical project, the result of the historic vision of Kohl, Mitterrand, and Jacques Delors, um, born of the Zeitung of uh, 1989, and still going strong. Just last week, we were in Zagreb celebrating a country that 30 years ago was at war and now entered the Union and 10 years after the single currency, Croatia. We all know how important the Franco-German engine is to move European integration forward. And so I'm encouraged by the joint declaration of last Sunday, which marked the 60th anniversary of the Elysee Treaty. There was a clear commitment to strengthen the European Monetary Union and to reach an agreement on a reform of our fiscal rules. So in conclusion, the war in Ukraine has in many ways been a wake-up call for Germany and for Europe. We cannot outsource our energy needs to Russia. We cannot outsource our security to the US and we cannot outsource our industry to China. And this is a, a big um, new awareness in the European Union. In less than a year, we have set in motion far-reaching changes from which there will be no turning back. The transition away from Russian fossil fuels, the push for stronger defense capabilities, the move towards a new industrial policy. So the road ahead is paved with uncertainty, but if we remain united and ambitious, united and ambitious, I am confident that a new Europe can be born out of this crisis, a fairer, greener, and more competitive Europe. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much for the for the speech that really spanned a, a broad area of, of different topics. Uh, and I'm also very happy to look in such a crowded uh, audience. I think we've uh, lost a bit this uh, the possibility of seeing each other in 3D rather than 2D. So in that respect, it's great to have you all here. Um, I will have a, a conversation with the commissioner now but then open up to your questions and also the questions in the audience uh, that is with us online. So we will have the opportunity to bring in the questions that are put forward in the chat functions. And I really encourage everyone online and here physically to not hold back. We'll come to you very soon and very quickly. 
and forgive me that maybe at the beginning and using my role here, um, I would focus a bit more on the economic policy issues that you've covered, looking in particular uh, at industrial policy. You mentioned the 30 years anniversary of the single market. And I, I would be grateful if you could maybe say a word on how you see the threat of the IRA. Um, what we observe here and also in the work we're doing at the Jacques Delors Center is that the impact in the US is significantly, uh, that uh, there is a lot of money that is put at the table, it's uncapped, it's also immediately available, so very, very directly uh, having an effect. Uh, it is, has both support for industry going green as well as buy American. So it seems to be an, a, a very powerful approach uh, in the US. The key question is how big of a threat is it here for European industry? Uh, how worried should we be? Uh, well, thank you for, for this uh, question. Uh, I think we should be um, reasonably worried. Um, why? Because the, the challenge of competitiveness um, is, is now uh, at an unprecedented level, I think, in relation to um, five, not, not 50 years ago, but five, ten years ago. Why is this? Well, because, as the professor said in, in her introduction, we are in the middle of the, well, an enormous uh, industrial revolution. Um, we also, uh, we have been a little bit uh, reluctant for, for some uh, years in recognizing the importance of industry. If you, re if you remember the, the debates that we had in Europe a few uh, 10, 20 years ago, well, manufacture industry was not the top of uh, our uh, concern and commitment. And now we are discovering that transforming our industries uh, because of this enormous transition we are in is crucial. And we discovered during the pandemic the uh, constraints of supply chains. So for this reason, not for the IRA in itself, but for the environment we are in, where uh, competition uh, on industrial policies is so strong uh, between US and China, and where Europe, which is the third big player, uh, has to, to, to play its role, um, this is a key priority. Uh, what I'm saying is that the IRA is uh, very much uh, discussed, and rightly so, because it comes on top of um, some disadvantages that we have. Uh, of course, the, the energy um, prices are now much, much lower than they were in, in the summer, uh, and they are more or less even lower than in the pre-war period. But despite this, if we look to the gas prices, for example, the gas prices are still two or three times higher than in the US. And this is a big issue of competitiveness for us and for our industries. The attraction of um, the IRA, which is, uh, of course, a good thing if we look to the uh, green intention of the uh, act, uh, but then it gives directly incentives for relocate uh, industries or for build and buy American, uh, cannot be underestimated. Uh, I think we should not uh, enter in a race of subsidies, uh, who is uh, subsidi subsidizing more its own economy this is not we are not able to do so we we don't have the uh, we are not a federal state uh, we are a, a different building uh, our european union so our competition 
should be based on our uh, point of strength uh, and uh, we should work to uh, encourage this point of strength more than um, giving um, subsidies uh, in the same way uh, that our American uh, partners are doing. Uh, final remark, a few years ago, um, the only uh, mentioning of the world industrial policy in Brussels would have been a little bit strange. What is this um, industrial policy? Do you want uh, bureaucrats to lead our economies? Uh, do you want to, um, to, 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 to frame with bureaucracy the, the industrial uh, autonomy, creativity, competition? Um, and this goes in parallel with another word, which is uh, strategic autonomy, which also was completely uh, non-existing in Brussels. So uh, we are starting a process. We have to do this very quickly um, without uh, forgetting that this is quite new for the European Union. The, I, I mentioned these two things. There are many others. Not many, some others, but industrial policy, strategic autonomy means that we look, uh, and let me uh, only quote Pascal Lamy uh, in a conversation we had a few months ago after the pandemic. He said, after the pandemic, uh, the EU cannot be the only herbivore in a world of carnivores. And this is a little bit the point. Uh, are we uh, thinking? to our mission in industrial policy, strategic autonomy, with the ambition to be global players, or are we uh, keeping the strength of our model without any changes? Thanks for, for mentioning Pascal Lamy, who, as I told you, has uh, uh, called before to give his regards also to you. But uh, would that not mean that we should uh, we should also take the U.S. Uh, to uh, to the WTO and threaten them legally with uh, with uh, some action against uh, and that's what what they have taken or what have done? No, my view this would be a mistake. Um, we are discussing with the U.S. and maybe we will also uh, have some results on the possibility. Uh, to have uh, on some sector, especially on full electric vehicles, uh, the same treatment that the U.S. are uh, giving to uh, trade partners like Mexico or Canada. And uh, we see some room of uh, reaching some objectives here. But I think we have to live with a paradox that this challenge comes from... Uh, the U.S. administration that in recent years um, probably had the better relation with the European Union uh, because of the multilateral approach of President Biden. Uh, and in many domains, I had my experience with Secretary Yellen on financial economic issues. Uh, we had a very good and strong cooperation. Uh, so we have to, to do our part of the job, not to fight with our American partners. But you, you mentioned that we don't really have a fully-fledged concept of industrial policy yet, really, and you have to develop it in a way on the go. At the same time, there is cause for actually loosening the very strong European instrument that we have, state aid. And in your speech, you uh, mentioned the risk of fragmentation. How, how real do you see that, that risk? Um, what would be the effect of uh, opening up the possibility to now, uh, to now give state aid without much constraint? Well, on industrial policy, I would say that we should concentrate on uh, assessing the priorities 
the programs, the sectors, where uh, working uh, at European level will give and provide an added value uh, because of the scale of the European intervention, because of the different um, assets and talents that we have in different countries, etc. Why? Because, of course, we have industrial policy at national level. And uh, the European industrial policy can only come on top of these policies. We are not cancelling national industrial policies. And we have industrial policy also based on subsidies. If, we, if you look to the full electric vehicles story, there are incentives for full electric vehicles in almost all <coughs> European countries or in the majority of European countries. They are national based, very different. So, I mean, industrial policy now for Europe means uh, looking at what kind of uh, uh, raw materials intervention, um, avant-garde technologies intervention needs a European funding and a European scale. Uh, as far as the uh, state aid is concerned, I think that uh, <clears throat> we should not disrupt the basis of our economic model, which is competition. Um, uh, so when I look to the state aid, uh, I am um, li limiting uh, my personal ambition. So I would rather um, change something especially in the sectors that need to be accelerated. Uh, I will work on making uh, procedures uh, faster, um, because of course, especially for projects that are in the next generation EU programs, uh, state aid should be, uh, opinions on state aid should be very, very fast. But I would not, um, um, completely loosen and give completely green light to state aid for two reasons. First, the risk that you mentioned of fragmentation. Uh, Commissioner Vestager um, circulated, as you know, a, some figures on how the temporary state aid framework decided after the Ukrainian war was used. And she uh, stressed the fact that it was uh, used, I mean, authorization given by the Commission, 54% uh, from uh, one country, the country we are uh, speaking, in 23% uh, from France, and maybe 7% for, from Italy. So uh, the rest, 14% was divided among 24 member states. Um, so uh, this is first problem, risk that different sides, different pockets, means different uh, capacity to, uh, to give uh, state aid to your companies. But the second is also that uh, it is obvious after the pandemic that the public uh, should play a stronger role in the economy. And this is happening. But it is also obvious after the pandemic that the liberal model based on uh, market and competition is better than the uh, autocratic and state-based model. It's much better. Um, you can have maybe longer decision-making process, and this is sure in, in the European Union, but at the end, you, the pandemic example was enormous in showing how best is this model for people and for... So, we, we should intervene, but without a, a disruption of the quality of the model that we have in Europe, in my, in my opinion. 
But if you look back at the discussion we had around the pandemic, and there was a proposal by the Commission of a solvency uh, support instrument, which was a, uh, an instrument that the Commission would have devised for money that we could have given out directly to companies, the first thing that member states crushed or scratched was this. So I think there is a tendency by the member states that they want the money themselves and decide themselves. While you said, look, we should do look at value added on cross-border spillovers that uh, actually benefit Europe as a whole. So how optimistic are you that you can take that route rather than uh, either no money or if money, then it's given by the member states and the member states will go for national champions? Well, I think that it is, we need, of course, the combination of these two things because we are not, uh, of course, um, sub working to, to substitute the national policies with uh, European policies. But it is clear that in several sectors, uh, without a European dimension, you go nowhere. And this is... Uh, when I, when I was in the other part of the table uh, as a member of the Italian government, uh, we had, <coughs> for example, <coughs> several discussions on uh, support of uh, a company which is it Italo-French company uh, making semiconductors. And this was not easy uh, to, to deal with in, in Brussels because of the risk of having this Italo-French company a dominant position in the European market. But if you look to this semiconductor sector from a global perspective, uh, this so-called dominant position was a very small uh, part of the global um, uh, game. So if we look, another story could be what happened happened with the solar uh, technologies. We were leading in solar technologies until 15 years ago. The Italian, the Spanish, others. And now we are lagging behind <coughs> China, but by far. Uh, so there are uh, key technologies of this transition that needs to be um, supported at European level and needs the scale of a market with 450 million people. Uh, and then there are many other things that uh, at national level you can continue to uh, promote. I mean, you spoke about new financing and new financing needs. Um, you also explained this, this morning in the interview with the FAZ uh, that, um, in fact, there is probably less money left at NGU than sometimes is reported, because more member states will take on uh, some of the loans. Yet, here in Germany, and to some extent you saw the echoes of that in the press conference you had just had with Finance Minister Lindner, there is, at least to some extent, questions that are posed by going beyond NGU and asking for new money. Um, and often these, these criticism is motivated by arguments that on the one hand one says uh, the absorption of the money is not as forthcoming. Uh, we don't really have yet a full evaluation of how effective NGU has, 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 has been. And there's also the question, are the projects and the objectives of where do we want to spend the money on uh, well defined? And how can we make sure that where already quite a lot of debt is accumulated at national level, we are not in a way putting this on top of, of the, the, the national debt in the terms of expanding the overall uh, uh, debt significantly? So in that respect, in particular on this issue of evaluating NGU and maybe not absorbing into you uh, to, in a sufficient way. What would be your counter-argument uh, counter to that? Well, this is a very serious discussion. I think, of course, uh, I am uh, aware of the fact that um, next generation EU um, programs, what we call the, the RRPs, the Recovery and Resilience Plan, country by country, 
uh, can be uh, uh, tweaked, uh, adjusted. We have a rather vague um, definition in in, the, in our rules, which is which says that you can tweak something on the basis of objective circumstances. Uh, I think we will on Wednesday uh, have a, a new uh, piece of regulation explaining a little bit more what these uh, objective circumstances are about. But of course, some uh, uh, adjustment because of the situation, inflation, uh, lack of components, etc., is justified. And uh, we recently proposed a um, a, a small uh, amendment to the German plan, for example, uh, as a commission uh, because of a couple of uh, programs that were uh, uh, not uh, perfectly uh, in time. Uh, and this will happen for several member states, of course. But I would avoid the risk to say, okay, uh, we start from scratch. Uh, these next generation EU plans were uh, designed uh, three years ago uh, and now the situation is completely different. So we take this money and you use it for other scopes. Uh, this first, um, it's very difficult to agree on because we need uh, several unanimous steps to change this. Uh, historical decision of the next generation EU. Second, I think this will uh, uh, cancel the pressure that we have to continue to have towards member states on delivering on these plans. If you uh, think that you can do whatever uh, with these resources, um, the pressure to absorb, to deliver, to implement will decrease. And this is not good, especially for countries that have level of absorption, difficult level of uh, absorption. Final point, um, is there enough money, not enough money? Well, of course, um, the next generation EU was a, an extraordinary uh, decision. The amount of grants of next generation EU is comparable to the amount of dollars of uh, the IRA. They are completely different stories, but more or less uh, 350, 300, 400, uh, they are comparable. But the, um, we can't um, use the same um, uh, money for 25 different scope. This is um, de temps en temps, uh, sometimes a, 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 a limit of our uh, own uh, initiative. No, we label the same um, basket of money with one word, then we change the word, but it's all, always the same uh, money. So, okay, we have next generation EU, commitment for absorption, some changes that are needed, and we are open to do them, uh, Repower EU is using, which is the chapter on energy, is using the remaining loans of next generation EU. So, the remaining loans of next generation EU have already a destination, which is this new program, Repower EU. By the way, the remaining loans will not be what we, we hear, 200 and I don't know what, because several countries that did not ask for loans uh, two years ago are asking for loans. Some, for example, Spain have a large quantity of loans, 80 billion, for example. So what remains from next generation EU is on repower EU, very important. How big will be this envelope, I don't know. I, I think around 100, 150 billion, and it is very important. Then we have all our competitiveness challenge, and here my suggestion would be to start not from the funding, but from the targets, the needs, 
uh, what are we talking about? Because the funding is unlimited. According to my services, we have 477 billion of additional um, investments needed each year from now to 2030 for only for the two transitions, the green and digital. Of course, this is mostly private, but part of this 477 pro year should be public. A small part, but it's something. So we have an, a mountain ahead of us of investments. But I would not start from the end. Um, how much, how we will we raise these funds? Let us start from the start. So from where is the added value? What are the programs that we should finance together? Knowing that financing these projects is not redistribution. Next Generation EU was also a solidarity fund. So a fund based on the fact that uh, stronger economies were supporting weaker economies. Solidarity uh, in front of the crisis. But if you identify a project on uh, clean hydrogen, it's not redistribution. You are not giving uh, this to Italy, this to Portugal, this to Finland. No, it's a common project. It's common financing. It's not um, moral hazard, to, to use a, a term very used, often used uh, in some countries. So let's start from the start and define the targets, the objectives, uh, the needs, and then we will come to the definition of the possible common funding, knowing that we have several countries reluctant uh, to have further common funding and fully respect, respecting these positions, of course. But if we speak of a common response to the competitiveness challenge, uh, do we think that this common response is only regulatory? I'm not sure that this is uh, the right answer. Mm. If it is common, something attached to this common response is needed. But what is not the something we should discuss now, but only after having assessed the needs and the targets? The proposal that you did on the fiscal rules in October, um, seems to me, in a way, something that should be discussed in, in, as a package with what you just outlined, yet you decided to bring that forward before. And you said you were optimistic that gradually there will be a solution on the, on the fiscal rules. On the, in the proposal that you put forward, there is quite a powerful position for the Commission to decide among member states and to negotiate individual strategy. Isn't this a very courageous kind of role that you give the commission that it will be powerful enough to really tell a, co a country what to do? Well, yes, the, there is a, 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 it's true that there is an increased role of the commission in our proposals, but there is also and mostly an increased role for member states uh, because the, 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 the principle is that uh, you have a, a, a path, a structural path of reduction of the debt and investments uh, that should be uh, proposed by member states. And of course, these proposals should take into account a reference framework that the Commission will provide, uh, but the decision will be a national decision. We are proposing this path of reduction of the debt and of investments, and then the Commission and the Council, not only the Commission, will uh, agree or disagree with this uh, uh, state member states proposal. Why are we going to this differentiation? But for the simple reason that we have 
a completely different um, situation of the debt among member states. Um, of course, we are not entering in the, the thresholds uh, established by the treaties, the famous 60%. But I, I, as I frequently uh, repeat, this famous 60% was not the proposal of the uh, economy Nobel Prize. The 60% was the average debt of the countries signing the treaties. So if you use this criteria, now the average debt of this country is 95%. But mm, only uh, my friend Klaus Regling, uh, <laughs> managing director of the ESM, uh, proposed to to go this way, which is a unfortunately uh, unfortunate, which is a way that we can't go on because it is politically impossible. So we keep uh, our reference, which is sixty percent. We change the rule that we had was the rule to reduce one twentieth of the debt, blah blah blah, uh, and we make it more adaptable to the differences among countries. You can't have an algorithm um, giving the same prescriptions to countries that have 150% of their GDP and countries that have 15% of their GDP. It's impossible. It's useless. It's only to decide not to have fiscal rules. I think, and I'm quite uh, satisfied of this, that this awareness is greatly shared by all member states, including those that are skeptical with our proposals. They start by the fact that the existing rules are no more working and we have to adapt them to this new reality. And the real reality is a big thing. Now we have also among the, for example, the two bigger European economies, you have a difference. Uh, of the level of debt, which was not there 30 years ago. Um, and uh, so I think we, real, we should be realistic and effective. Uh, and this path that we propose, I think, is effective. Uh, if we want uh, to, to, to go back to the previous rules after the general escape clause will be uh, concluded, I think we, we give a very bad message to our citizens, to the markets, uh, and to our economies. But here, again, I repeat, I see a common awareness. And very happy that we are negotiating, but starting from the point that we have to change these rules. So we've covered a, a, a lot of ground, went into quite a lot of economic policy issues. Please feel free to raise questions that are on your mind. Uh, can also go beyond uh, the, the economic issues we've just raised. Um, Laura is going around, and maybe we start from the back, the, the person in the left. And yeah. if you don't mind. Hi, um, thank you for your speech. My name is Tim. I'm a Hurdy School alumni. Um, you outlined that we have a profound need for deeper economic and also military integration in the European Union. Now, these are very fundamental issues that pertain to state sovereignty and thus the democratic process. My question to you is, how much do these aims of deeper economic and military integration depend upon a more democratic integration in the European Union? Or to put it more simply, how can we have everybody on board with economic integration on a more deeply level if so far decisions on the European level are somewhat far removed from everyday people and from everyday citizens? Thank you very much. Uh, Lara, maybe Fl Florineda here for. Ah, oh, okay. The microphone. One, two, three. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for your time, Commissioner. Aldav, you've been welcomed by terrible uh, weather in Berlin uh, today. Have you got a warmer, uh, less hostile uh, welcome by Christian Liner and possibly in the Chancery as well on? Your ideas, the ideas you are putting forward on behalf of the Commission, uh, both on the EGR, uh, the, the budgetary chapter of the, the, the IRA, um, 
reaction. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about those bilaterals you may have had or, you, or you're having tomorrow, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and I would have a more technical question perhaps on, on um, this uh, sovereignty fund. Uh, the idea, and you put it again for what tonight, is to uh, make up for the potential distortive effects uh, within the single market that more and more and more state aid uh, would have. Do you conceive of that new instrument um, or do you, would you attach to it uh, some sort of uh, newish uh, repartition key that would actually and expressly go in the direction of, of evening up uh, distortions within the single market? Good, thank you. Uh, I see that we, we have a, a really big array of, 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 uh, of topics here, but maybe we conclude the first round, Florian Eder. Here. Thank you. I'm, I'm Florian from Politik. Hi. Uh, on, based on the last question, I'd also have the curiosity of how you would characterize your, the welcome that you got by Finance Minister Lindner. It was a pretty direct no or, or even a, a rather uh, impolite no to your, to your proposals, as I, would, as I would call it. But uh, what, my question is, what does that tell you about, the, the, about how, how realistic it is to expect uh, an agreement on these new fiscal rules and on the reform of the fiscal rules by March in the in the European Council meeting in March already. But, but maybe we have the one last question here on the left, uh, and then and then we. Pause. Hello, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm not an economist, so if I use the wrong terminology, please, please excuse me. Um, but what I've been wondering, reading about how the U.S. is protecting its economy and its competitiveness, and we are protecting potentially be protecting our competitiveness through the European Sovereignty Fund. I'm just wondering what, where this puts other countries around the world, in the Global South, who don't have the means to protect their competitiveness in the same way. Does this increase global inequality, or what other ways are there for other countries to also still access the markets that we're kind of closing off through these measures? Thank you. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, indeed, the, uh, it's difficult to uh, imagine that a, a real process of uh, uh, increasing economic and military integration uh, could go without a, uh, a stronger um, uh, European institution and, and democracy. So I, I fully agree. I have no solutions in my pocket because we all know how difficult this is, uh, how uh, dangerous we are, uh, dangerous, how difficult and with uh, negative consequences where the uh, um, attempt that were made a few years ago with the referendums, etc., in increasing. Uh, so the, the story of this marvelous uh, thing, which is the, the European project, which is maybe the most uh, interesting, successful, and beautiful integration pro pro project in the world, um, uh, it's a complicated story. We, we, we don't have easy, uh, easy uh, solutions. What the experience shows us is that um, to the policymakers is the task uh, to try to uh, use um, the, the events, uh, the, 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 what happens, uh, more than to uh, plan uh, a theoretical uh, strengthening of the, uh, I don't know, the, the democratic process uh, without uh, the real possibility to implement it. So I think, honestly, that we did a good job during the pandemic and that uh, doing this job, uh, we also weakened very much the anti-European positions in several uh, member states. 
they are still there, of course, but uh, uh, it, it's um, incredibly um, strong uh, how the European uh, project showed uh, itself, for example, during this Ukrainian uh, crisis. Uh, I was the Italian foreign minister in the months after the, the Crimea uh, annexation, and I can assure you that uh, at the time, uh, agreeing on very uh, small, light, almost symbolic uh, sanctions was very, very, very difficult. And in this case, we were able to agree on substantial initiatives I was uh, mentioning before 3.6 billion of military equipment aid uh, delivered unanimously. Uh, so um, I have no other solution than to respond, yes, we need to um, increase our uh, democracy, um, the responsibility of the European Parliament, um, but I think we should do so uh, managing the crisis, managing the events, um, because otherwise, well, we had this conference on the future of Europe a few um, uh, months ago, uh, and we are working the Commission on the conclusions, but I'm not sure that this will give us an enormous uh, push so, yes, but how we will do this, I think we will do this in practice and managing uh, events and crises more than uh, building a new, maybe it will come, uh, an opportunity to build a new institutional uh, step, uh, but I'm not sure that this is now the, the, the point. Uh, on the on the uh, meeting I had uh, this afternoon with the finance minister Lindner, I, I think it was uh, uh, quite friendly, not at all hostile, uh, and uh, Lindner, uh, of course, uh, stressed uh, its own position, which were not uh, completely uh, surprising me, because I, I meet Lindner. Uh, twice a month, and it's, it was not a premiere. And uh, I fully respect its own position. Uh, what is important for me, um, of course, despite the differences that are clear, is that uh, the, the Bundes finance minister uh, committed Germany uh, to um, constructively discuss uh, the uh, economic governance rules on the basis of the proposal of the Commission. And for me, this is good news, and I will work to give to this good news positive development. <coughs> last point, no, last two points. Um, sovereignty fund, uh, what kind of allocation keys, uh, in my view, um, uh, well, the, the debate on the solid, uh, sovereignty fund, as the president called it, um, is, uh, I, I wouldn't say not started, but is just starting. And as I said before, I think we should start from the targets, from the objectives, from the programs, and not from the distribution keys and, and so on. I add that, in my view, this is a common funding instrument, not a redistribution instrument. So I'm not thinking of allocating the resources of a sovereignty fund to this or that country. I am thinking to using this kind of fund for common targets, common objectives. Then you can have also uh, a different instruments uh, that are targeted to uh, countries with uh, more limited fiscal space. And these are the instruments we refer in our uh, language um, as uh, sure-like instruments. You know? Why do we call this sure-like? Because this mechanism of an instrument based on loans 
uh, was adopted for um, uh, during the pandemic for this uh, short time where schemes uh, support of the sure mechanism it was used by 16 member states um, they had only the advantage of having better financial condition in the markets it was not money uh, but a more favorable uh, condition of financing and given the fact that uh, condition of financing are tightening in the markets, it is possible that this kind of instrument could again become uh, important. Um, I'm not saying again that this is a new uh, common debt to be um, uh, decided by uh, countries and member states. I am saying that this could be a common financial instrument. Uh, reducing the risk of fragmentation. How this could be funded, we will see. It's not something that we have to decide today. Um, final point, the other countries. This is a big, big, uh, of course, issue. Because I, I, as I said in my, in my remarks, uh, this crisis is affecting uh, differently different areas of the world and the more affected among the rich countries is Europe and the more affected overall is the emerging economies and the global south um, and um, as the IMF uh, underlined frequently in recent months we have uh, dozens of uh, uh, emerging economies at risk uh, for their debt because of the strong dollar and because of the tightening of financing conditions. Um, are we doing enough for these countries um, in cooperation, etc.? Well, we are trying to, to work uh, at European level. We established new initiatives. I'm not now uh, describing them. Um, I think we should always have in mind as Europeans that our future is strongly uh, connected to uh, at least the future of uh, the Mediterranean and Africa. This block um, of um, the countries, Europe, Mediterranean, Africa, uh, will have billions of uh, people in very uh, little amount of time and how we manage these relations and this come, goes from migration to the economy is crucial because um, for us it's the future uh, the relation with uh, Mediterranean and Africa for us Europeans um, what we did until now is uh, completely insufficient. I'm happy of what we were able to do. For example, this special drawing rights um, that were finally decided thanks to the change in the US administration because this was uh, Janet Yellen's um, result. Um, we were supposed to use at least 100 billion of this uh, 600 that were raised for emerging economies and we are not yet uh, completely there. So the process should be strengthened. Uh, I am I, very satisfied of also what the German presidency of the G7 made on this meeting with the African countries, very good. But we, we are lagging behind what would be needed. Thank you very much. I have a question. Anke, you wanted to pose a question. Then I would also like to take two of the chat questions uh, that we've got. I'm on the faculty of the Hattie School. And um, I would like to thank you for your remarks here. My question is, um, if we look at the history of, of German economic policy, it was always the case that Germany protected its industries heavily. And that was the case even before COVID and before the war in Ukraine. And it, it might have led us to the dependency on, on Russian oil, but also on the market in China. So it was always a double-edged sword, the way Germany went about it. 
And now the reactions to COVID, but also not to the war, was that Germany provided a heavy package, a state aid package to protect its industries again. And that leads to asymmetries, as you said in your remarks. It is difficult for other European countries to deal with that because other countries don't have these deep pockets. So my question to you is, what would you expect from Germany, from the German government, how to develop its own industrial policy, but also economic policy, by maintaining the industrial base that it has, but not creating further asymmetries to other European member states? So we move to the online questions. Yes. Well, number one, uh, how do you see EU strategic autonomy and defense reconcile with NATO, especially in a world moving again towards two blocks? And the second question is, the better integration of the macroeconomic imbalance procedure in the fiscal rules is a strength of your reform proposals. But why has the Commission not called for the MIP to be put on a symmetrical footing? A sy sy symmetrical footing, so the asymmetry imbalances. Okay, maybe maybe one one last question from from the, from this side, maybe, maybe here. Good evening. Uh, how have the relations uh, been so far with the new Italian government? Have you seen any oh. substantial changes to Mr. Draghi uh, cabinet? Uh, and if you are more skeptical or uh, optimistic about the Italian contribution in the future regarding the, the topics we have covered today. Thank you very much. Uh, well, dulcis in fundo, okay. Uh, <laughs> the, well, the, the, I think it's very clear, uh, well, first of all, uh, we should be uh, aware of the fact that uh, Germany was um, of course, essential in uh, deciding uh, some new extraordinary programs that we are now using and we are now celebrating. So uh, there is the protective side of the coin, but there is also uh, a strong solidarity side that we experienced during the pandemic. Um, and uh, both the decisions taken by finance ministers with uh, Olaf Scholz and the decisions taken by the leaders with uh, Angela Merkel were uh, decisions of uh, unprecedented solidarity. Um, and they worked. I think we should tell to our European citizens that this an unprecedented uh, uh, solidarity and uh, common financing act, which was next generation EU, worked. It reassured markets. We went out from this pandemic crisis with um, more or less um, similar speed, the different European countries, um, rejoining the pre-pandemic level of growth um, in during uh, 10 months, the, the, all the different countries. So, uh, and we had um, some countries that uh, were lagging behind in terms of growth that had very good level of growth uh, during uh, 22 and 21. So, this part, uh, very good, very positive. Uh, as far as the future is concerned, I think we should base our analysis on the fact that the interdependence of our economic systems is now enormous. So, um, when um, we heard uh, a few weeks ago better uh, news about the German economy, um, or, or less negative news about the German economy. This was very good news, for example, for the Italians or for the Czech uh, Republic or for other parts of Europe uh, whose manufacture is strongly linked to the German uh, manufacture. So at the end of the day, it's the, old, the same old story. Um, 
we need a, 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 a strong Germany, but strong Germany means a Germany strongly um, in the European framework uh, and not the opposite. I think it's something that was said maybe 35 or 40 years ago, but it is still the reality, in my view. Um, how to, um, uh, to keep the, the strategic autonomy and the commitment on NATO um, together? Well, I think that this question uh, asked um, one year and a half ago uh, would have been less easy to answer. Uh, uh, for example, in the uh, weeks and months after the um, Afghanistan um, um, re withdrawal, you know, there was a sort of skepticism on the role of transatlantic relation that was, in my view, unjustified, but it was there. And someone at the time could have conceived the uh, European common defense or strategic autonomy as a substitute for uh, NATO. Well, I think that what happened um, since uh, February of last year um, clarified to everyone that this is not the case. Uh, because, of course, uh, only the existence of NATO uh, uh, gave this sense of unity uh, of our countries, the transatlantic cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. NATO is not committed directly at all in this kind of conflict, but of course it is the uh, framework of our alliance and it is more important than ever to be reassured. Just think to the fact that these two countries, Sweden and Finland, uh, well, Three years ago, nobody would have thought that they would uh, ask to join NATO. So um, it is very clear what NATO is and it is and how important it is. And it is very clear that if we want to play a role uh, at global level, uh, we need to have um, also a common defense. And when I when I uh, hear uh, talking of uh, the increasing of defense spending, I'm, I say, okay, but what are we looking for? We are looking for a stronger Bundeswehr, a stronger Armée Française, uh, a stronger uh, Esercito Italiano, or we are looking uh, to an industrial challenge uh, and to uh, some common defense initiatives. Uh, I, I mentioned before the vertical dimension. We, we can't only look to the horizontal dimension, Russia. There is the vertical dimension, Mediterranean and Africa. Uh, I don't see NATO as the solution of all the problems in this vertical dynamic. I think in this vertical dynamic, we have a very important role to play um, for a European common defense. Not easy, but I think to, uh, to increase. Uh, last but not least, the Italian um, uh, government. Uh, well, but I think it, it's not for me to, to I, I, I have to play the role of the European Commission. I can't play the role of the Italian politician here. And as European Commissioner, I have to only to say that the uh, Italian authorities were uh, in, in this uh, start of the experience of the new government that won the elections, uh, they were very committed in all our European files. Uh, we gave a overall positive assessment of the budget law uh, as far as the economy is concerned. More important than this, I see the Italian authorities very strongly committed on Ukraine, 
which was not obvious, uh, giving uh, different opinions that we know are there in the governing coalition. And so I would say so far so good. And for, for the European Union, I think to have a um, Italian government which is uh, with its own position, of course, committed in European affairs is good news. And uh, um, this is a little bit also the atmosphere that we feel in Brussels. An, an atmosphere, I'm not saying that this uh, will last forever. Um, maybe it will improve. Maybe it will uh, go in opposite direction. But this is the state of the things now, and it is, I think, reassuring. Thank you very much. Uh, let, me, let me conclude with maybe two small personal remarks. First of all, I, I have to say of seeing you today, but also over the last uh, years uh, as, as commissioner, I was always impressed by the calmness with which, and the respect with which you take other positions. And I think you've proven this uh, again today, uh, trying to understand and respect where people come from but always with a sense of optimism that finally a solution will be found, and often you've proven right. So let's take that optimism with us. And uh, a second point is that we are sitting here in the Henrik Enderlein Forum, yeah. which is named after the former president and founder of the Jacques Law Center. And I think, if I may, Henrik would probably have been proud to be again providing here with Hertie the Forum for Public Discourse. So thank you very much for coming. Also to the listeners online, and have a good evening.